Good morning, everybody. My name is Paul Stronsky, uh, and I'm senior fellow in the uh, Russia and Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace uh, here in Washington, DC. Good afternoon to those of, uh, those of you watching in Europe and good evening to those of you watching uh, in Central Asia. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to our live virtual event on the upcoming uh, Kyrgyzstan's uh, uh, pre um, presidential elections, the Kyr which we've entitled What's Next? Um, uh, I'd like to thank our longstanding partners uh, for helping us uh, organizing this. This is a joint effort uh, with Radio for Europe, Radio uh, Liberty, the Davis Center uh, at Harvard University, the Central Asia Program at George Washington University, and the OXIS Society uh, for Central Asian Affairs. Uh, we're also going to be following up uh, this event with a discussion on uh, the elections in Kazakhstan uh, next week that will be hosted uh, by uh, 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 the the GW, um, their Central Asian program. Uh, now, you know, we've seen a lot of, uh, uh, the last time we, we brought a, a group of people to discuss uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan, it was a little over uh, two months ago. Uh, seems like a lifetime ago in, the, in the, all the changes we've seen in, in the world. Uh, but this fall was really quite tumultuous um, uh, uh, after uh, the, um, the elections uh, in Kyrgyzstan in October uh, 2020. Uh, the former president, uh, Jan Bieka, was ousted. Uh, we've seen a real rise of sort of uh, some criminal groups. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is now holding uh, early presidential elections um, and a referendum on constitutional uh, reform uh, for on January uh, 10th, uh, which is two days away. Uh, leaving this push for these elections um, uh, and the referendum is Sadir uh, Japarov, um, who uh, really rose uh, to power um, uh, in uh, the last few months. Um, uh, and he's really risen to, uh, you know, some senior ranks. Uh, we've also uh, worryingly uh, in the last few months have seen a, a rising repression and rising re intimidation. So, um, Kyrgyzstan has long been known uh, in the United States in the West as Central Asia's on only democracy. Um, uh, but I think uh, uh, that is certainly being uh, tested both in the recent events, but also in the rising concern um, over uh, uh, civil liberties, civil society, uh, journalism, and the intimidation that we've been seeing uh, in the last uh, 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 few weeks. Uh, so what I'd like to do, um, I would like to sort of turn it over to our panelists to give us a sort of an update of, of what's going on and, and their projections, uh, you know, for the future, talk about this election, uh, the problems that the country is facing, uh, and where we go um, uh, from here. I'd like to introduce our panels. The first we have uh, is Ambassador uh, Bakit Beshimov, who's a faculty member and professor at Northeastern University uh, in the Global Studies and International Relations Program. He's a former ambassador uh, of Kyrgyzstan to Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, and Kyrgyzstan's parliamentary representative to the OSCE in Europe. Uh, we have doc, uh, Dr. Asel Dolokeldieva, who's um, an associate fellow at the OSCE Academy in Bishkek, where her research focuses on social mobilization, democratization, and institution building um, uh, in Kyrgyzstan and, and the region. Uh, and she has a PhD from the University of Exeter. We have Kubat uh, Kasimbekov, who works for the uh, RFERL's Kyrgyz service. Uh, he worked for the Kyrgyz service in the BBC in London uh, for quite a while and joined the Prague headquarters uh, of RFERL uh, in 2016. Um, and I believe um, he's, he's been doing a lot of reporting from Bishkek. Uh, and uh, we have uh, from, uh, from Osh, we have Akhilai Karimova, who's an activist with over 10 years of experience in peace building and development programs in Kyrgyzstan. She's based in Osh, as I mentioned, and she works for the Center uh, for the Support of International Protection and T Media, a local media outlet. Um, so if I, if I could uh, turn it over to our speakers, I'd like to, each of you to give about five, uh, five minutes or so, uh, and then we can move uh, to uh, question and answers. We have a live audience uh, who can pose their questions via the YouTube uh, live chat, uh, and they will be piped into us uh, in the, in the um, uh, uh, inside in, in this forum. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll turn to Estelle first, um, uh, if she could sort of set the scene, if to remind us why these elections are being held, what are the stakes, what are the problems, and what are the prospects, and what are the concerns uh, moving forward uh, for the next, that we all should be watching for the next few days. Please, Estelle. Sure. Um, good evening, or good morning uh, for you. Um, glad to be here uh, to discuss this important event. Um, just to contextualize, indeed, um, this elections and upcoming the referendum. So um, on October the 5th, um, 2020, uh, Kyrgyzstan witnessed um, a third a formal, um, forceful change of government, if not to account uh, for um, 
two other informal. Um, in 2012, there was an um, attempted uh, coup, um, actually by Jabarov, Tashiev, and Mamitov, uh, the leading troika of uh, today's politics. Um, and in 2017, the constitutional coup uh, organized by that on life. So we have some uh, another cycle uh, of revolutionary situations uh, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, what has happened then on the 5th of October, um, one could probably frame as a uh, large uh, demonstration uh, went uh, wrong, gone wrong. Um, uh, people who uh, gathered on the main square in Bishkek demanded uh, to cancel their outcomes of um, uh, rigged elections and to announce the new um, elections. Uh, however, uh, there were also other um, uh, reasons for that outcry, public outcry. It's basically the criticism, public criticism of um, uh, corruption and also the mismanagement of uh, COVID pandemic. And um, this public outcry was there uh, for quite some time, but the central authorities turned a blind, blind eye on both of the issues, the corruption and the pandemic. So the authorities were um, basically failed to attend to popular grievances. And when the, um, the large demonstrations took place, uh, the authorities once again failed to um, attend to these grievances because Jean Beckham had a chance to meet the people and stop the violence. So, um, and we also have another thing is that uh, nobody uh, on that day uh, among the political elites were able to lead the change. This is something what I call a crisis of authentic figures, is that we have plenty of political parties and plenty of informal leaders, but nobody could fill the gap. But Japarov did. Uh, so uh, once out of the prison, he immediately rushed to the main square and filled this um, political uh, space free. He claimed that uh, he is outside of the establishment, he has a clean reputation with no corruption record, and this way he managed to somehow usurpate the, uh, the public space. Um, he, it seems like he was aided by uh, some connections to mafia and mm, large money um, with the help of, um, there's information that with the help of Madraimov, he was able to uh, take control of the parliament, uh, sideline the deputies, uh, uh, place his own uh, friend as the president of the parliament, um, and um, also sidelined the acting president. So the very rapid fall of the incumbent president, Jan Beckoff, was really something that nobody expected because nobody demanded for it. And uh, from the simply a scientific perspective, it's really interesting to see how the, the regime became really fragile under the pressure of the organized crime and um, uh, big oligarchy. So um, after Jan Beckoff was removed, um, Japarov uh, managed to place uh, his friends uh, and people to important key positions. So he took under control the general prosecution, uh, he took under control uh, the uh, special um, security forces, the, basically the main coercive apparatus, so to, in order to exert influence on the courts, justices, uh, and on other branches of, uh, of power. And this is how he then prepared himself a ground for an easy victory. So um, uh, by also skillfully playing with the, the popular grievances, he uh, claimed um, as um, he is now very much supported by ordinary people. So he is tapping into uh, different types of grievances, nationalistic ones, but also religious. So he is, uh, people are associating him with a, a God's messenger, a little bit like uh, Trump's evangelist rep uh, support base in the US. So there is a lot of mixture of different types of sentiments, which is making him very popular among the ordinary citizens. And uh, the, uh, the different surveys, for example, show that uh, if to Tomorrow there were elections, uh, he would get uh, 64 or 68% of popular vote. Interestingly, actually, the people whom I've been um, talking to, they don't really uh, know about his program. They're not really interested to know what are the uh, Japarov's uh, ideas, how to reform the country, for example. What is interesting is that they are filling uh, themselves, uh, their uh, Japarov's um, agenda with all different types of demands. Somebody wants him to, for example, 
fight against corruption. Somebody wants him to fight against the Chinese migrants. Somebody wants uh, uh, him to, uh, I don't know, put the ethnic minorities on their places. And this kind of filling basically Japarov's agenda with their own uh, grievances. So this is very interesting that Japarov, in my opinion, doesn't really belong to himself. He now belongs to the people uh, in that sense. So, um, and I think that unless something extraordinary happens on the 10th of January, uh, he is going to be winning with a landslide victory in the first round. Um, they, uh, we have very good opposition leaders and they are kind of representing different uh, types of segments of population. There are religious leaders, but there are a lot of liberals, uh, but unfortunately um, nobody's really interested in their programs or ideas because uh, the way people support uh, the vote for uh, uh, Japarov, the vote, uh, the support for Japarov is not a creative vote, if I might, might say that. It's a destructive vote. What they want uh, with him is not only a hope for future, they want to punish. The anti-elite, the anti-establishment discourse is so extremely huge in Kyrgyzstan that they basically see in Japarov an instrument to punish the elite and to put an end to uh, corruption. So, um, to probably a little bit wrap up my uh, my talk here is that um, what I'm say, trying to say is that so he will be most likely winning the elections. Uh, it's going to be a very easy victory for him because he already captured the state, the state's apparatus, so which is working very well for him right now. The um, the elites have defected from Jean Becker and now joined his team because they want to continue uh, having access to the pie, um, and the, he has a, a overwhelming population support who actually also uh, support the uh, return to strong authoritarianism. So for example, the ideas of Kurultai are supported to 51% among the population. Uh, the support of the uh, holding of the referendum is supported to 70%. Um, and uh, this idea of a strong president is basically uh, why it re-emerged after one can ask, we had some, such a bad experience of uh, strong presidentialism in Kyrgyzstan, so why people would forget about this uh, negative experience and uh, one uh, would, would want to go back to that kind of um, uh, governance is that because an idea emerged that um, uh, a relationship to the president is uh, can restore the people's sovereignty, the people's power, because they can appoint the president, but they can also uh, remove it. Is this this kind of normalization of the coup, normalization of the popular uprising as a um, kind of um, a normal way to get rid of a leader uh, that, that they don't want anymore? Whereas it's very difficult to remove 120 deputies to remove the parliament. Um, so that's why people support today very much these ideas of returning to the authoritarianism. And of course, there are very heavy consequences of that. And uh, we might discuss that later during the, um, during the discussion. If I'm running out of time, I'm, I'm not sure about that. If not, I can say a couple of words about the consequences. Um, let's uh, look at the consequences maybe in the, in the discussion uh, and, um, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like that's going to be a, uh, what you describe is going to be a recipe for stability in the long term either, um, which I think is, is, is equally troubling. Uh, now for uh, Kubat, I was wondering, you know, could you tell us a little bit about the situation on the ground um, in Bishkek and the country? You know, how do you sort of see this electoral process going? What are your expectations for the vote? Um, and, you know, what are the pitfalls and, and problems um, that, that, uh, you know, we, people should be watching out for. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Paul, for this opportunity, and thank you, Asel, for the so for an excellent overview. Uh, today is the final day of the election campaign, and the presidential candidates, uh, seven of them, have less than twelve hours uh, to uh, finalize uh, their campaign. And on the first uh, days uh, of this campaign, many observers uh, noted uh, that uh, this campaign would have like less drama or less unpredictability compared to the 2017 presidential election because this campaign uh, started with, as I said, uh, one candidate's enormous uh, advantage or dominance in many ways. For example, uh, shortly after the campaign uh, kicked off, uh, Bishkek and several other cities in the country were uh, overwhelmed uh, by Sadr Jabbar's posters and 
adverts and the same could be said for online and TV adverts. And according to the Central Election Commission's latest uh, figures, uh, Japarov uh, uh, has officially spent uh, more, more money than all remaining candidates had spent uh, during this election uh, campaign. And I think this is around uh, $700,000 officially. And uh, as we know, during the last uh, parliamentary election campaign, we witnessed a fierce <laughs> between uh, parties, not only on the ground, but also on social media. Uh, but compared to the parliamentary election elections, uh, the first two weeks of this current campaign was relatively calmer and quieter. Uh, nevertheless, uh, towards the middle and the end of this uh, campaign, we started uh, witnessing some activities and movements uh, from other uh, candidates, uh, for example, four oppositional uh, candidates, Kanabek uh, Iman Aliyev, Adhan Madumarov, Kanat Isayev, and uh, Clara Soronkulova decided to join their forces, uh, mostly against uh, Sadr uh, Japarov. And they said that they would back one uh, candidate uh, should there be a runoff election. And some candidates uh, have complained about the misuse of uh, state. Uh, uh, resources uh, where actually Japarov's uh, allies now occupy mostly top uh, posts. And for example, uh, Japarov's one of the main uh, challengers, Adaham Madumarov, said that his team was denied an access to certain campaigning uh, regions. And another candidate, uh, Abdil Sigizbayev, uh, said uh, bandits uh, threatened his campaign staff uh, members. And actually, today is the last uh, round of the tele televised debates going on on the national TV channel. And during those uh, debates, um, uh, many candidates uh, kind of criticized uh, Japarov and his possible policies. Uh, but Japarov um, denied all the allegations, but uh, he, he uh, didn't show up uh, for both rounds of these uh, televised debates. And he described this debate as a place uh, of uh, rumors, yes. And despite the current authorities promise um, uh, no, some non-governmental organizations like uh, Common Cause uh, uh, have uh, reported of uh, some cases when administrative resources were misused, when um, someone tried to intimidate uh, voters for example, Common Cause reported that um, one case which took place in the Karasu district, which is the, the most uh, populated uh, district in uh, Kyrgyzstan, according to their report, uh, young men went to house to house in the region and demanded that uh, people should uh, uh, vote vo for Japarov, otherwise uh, they would get, uh, they would see some uh, consequences. But uh, Japarov's uh, supporters in, and the local police uh, have denied this report, and police uh, described this kind of report as uh, baseless. Um, the new government, uh, which was formed after the October event, uh, is saying that they have created all uh, possible conditions for free and fair elections. Uh, a few days ago, uh, Vice Prime Minister uh, Mahsat Mahmoud Khanov took part in our political talk show in Bishkek and said that irregularities uh, recorded during this uh, campaign would be kind of considered nothing compared to what we witnessed during the parliamentary elections in October. Another peculiarity of this campaign is uh, that it's being kind of accompanied by the use of online uh, trolls and online attacks uh, targeting uh, certain politicians, uh, journalists and media organizations like uh, RFRL's Kyrgyz service, uh, Club Media, and also other independent uh, media outlets. And actually this case uh, was mentioned in OSC Observer's interim report, which was published, I think, uh, to weeks ago and actually since the October events media outlets outlets like uh, RFRL's Kyrgyz service uh, and other media organizations have received 
uh, plenty of online threats uh, from social media users, uh, including anonymous accounts uh, who call themselves uh, kind of Japarov supporters or supporters of the current uh, uh, government. Uh, for last few weeks, uh, we are witnessing some reports uh, from uh, TV channels which are which are associated uh, with uh, members of the current uh, government uh, um, kind of promoting some allegations toward uh, certain media uh, outlets and as many local and international experts emphasize um, journalists have played uh, enormous role in revealing uh, corruption schemes in Kyrgyzstan, a referrals Kyrgyz service alongside uh, its partners like CLOB, OCCRP, uncovered uh, a deep corruption scheme at the Kyrgyz uh, state customs and, and on the uh, Kyrgyz-Chinese border as well, which actually uh, corruption scheme that created conditions to plunder uh, millions of uh, dollars. And the main character of our investigative report, Raim Bikmatraim, of uh, former deputy uh, head of the Kyrgyz state customs, uh, was reportedly a key financial backer for the Mekenim Kyrgyzstan party, which dominated the October for parliamentary elections uh, by reportedly shadeways. So our journalists faced the pressure and threats uh, during when we were working on those investigative uh, reports. And it's really concerning that uh, these kind of cases, uh, we are witnessing this kind of uh, cases, threats and online intimidations uh, over and over again. So in any case, um, as Asel said, uh, current in kind of, uh, Mm, uh, many people whom I spoke uh, giving their preference towards one candidate and uh, also uh, some people, many people actually, uh, supporting Japarov's ideas uh, to turn to the presidential uh, system of uh, governance. And uh, But uh, I should say that it's still unclear whether a majority of the voters had enough uh, time and information to make a choice on determining the form of uh, governance. Uh, I should also mention that uh, throughout this campaign, uh, civil activists continued uh, protesting the proposed draft of, of uh, the new constitution, mostly on Sundays. And uh, hence, uh, we are yet to see whether this election, presidential election, and the referendum will bring kind of a rapid stability to the country. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now in the interest of time, I might just uh, jump over and get uh, Akilai's uh, perspective, uh, you know, get her thoughts of, um, you know, what she is, um, you know, what are, are residents in, in, in Osh and what they're thinking and, and saying about uh, this election? Uh, how does it differ from the perspective of, of people based in, in Bishkek? Uh, what's the sort of civil society um, expectations, uh, both for the vote and what comes next? Um, and also, you know, I think a lot of our discussions in the past, we've gotten a, a Bishkek view of, of the political turmoil that's been happening in the country. So I think we, our, our audience would really appreciate an Osh view of everything that's happened um, in the last few months, too. So please. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you and give some perspective from Osh. So I would like to start with the uh, little, you know, game of differences between the uh, between the absolute candidate for the president and with uh, uh, other previous candidates that we have witnessed in the past history. So we have, uh, let's say, we had before Jane Baker of. Uh, um, uh, Atambayev, uh, Rosal Atambayev, uh, Bakiev, and Akaya for 30 years. So there's um, the, 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 we have formed a tradition of unconditional candidates to the um, uh, presidential elections. So if you see the, uh, actually the, the history of presidential elections, uh, before they took place, everybody knew who would be winning, who is the favorite, um, who is the um, uh, absolute unconditional candidate. So uh, this time it's uh, no difference. Um, so Sadir Japarov is being um, 
as uh, Kubata Nasel mentioned, he is the only actual um, uh, candidate that has took a huge advantage uh, uh, from the, uh, let's say, establishment uh, and, and the wild, wild um, pop, uh, population uh, of Kyrgyzstan. So, uh, but there is a difference between, uh, so Sadr Japarov and others. Uh, and uh, I would say from Osh, I see the difference is that even though Sadr Japarov is being originally not from Osh, not from the South, but from um, Northern Issaquil, let's say, uh, he uh, still gained a lot of support and loyalty from um, both um, uh, elite uh, southern um, establishment, let's say, and the wild, uh, wide population. So I can say that by uh, many interviews and many uh, conversations I had with uh, local uh, people here, uh, and they are not concerned about the fact that he is not from Osh, uh, he's not from South, but they, and, and they have no any concern that, um, uh, he actually was uh, in previous team of Bakiev. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this uh, actually is not uh, something uh, that would be, you know, worrying uh, the um, random uh, population. Uh, but I would say that uh, this is something that uh, the local population would argue that, uh, so if he is with Maxim Bakiev or Kurmanbek Bakiev, uh, maybe it's for good rather than for bad. So uh, people still have the, uh, uh, the sentiments uh, that uh, uh, Sadr Japarov uh, would be, uh, if he would be restoring uh, the legacy of uh, Bakiev, this is not a big deal for them, you know. So this is the first thing that I, I would like to mention. And the second thing, Thing is that um, even though he um, was kind of a, the first consolidating uh, candidate for both regions, north and south, uh, he still divided the society uh, and uh, he divided between the those who actually are so much in euphoria about uh, Sadr Japarov and those who actually are pro, um, pro law, pro rule of law in Kyrgyzstan, mostly civil activists and mostly um, the young people uh, in central Bishkek. Uh, Kubat mentioned that every Sunday, those young people, they go for March. Um, so, and um, I think uh, this is uh, something that we should, this, this, is, uh, this is not a new conflict, I would say, uh, for Kyrgyzstan, uh, that the leader actually dividing the civil society, uh, society and uh, uh, puts uh, the confronting uh, sides uh, between them. This is not new, but the new thing is that the candidate is doing that before he took place, before he uh, show, showed up in president's office, which means that uh, if he is elect president, then um, it's gonna bring us to more um, confrontation, I guess, uh, already between the uh, government and the uh, civil society. So, uh, and uh, given the large number of violations uh, before and during the elections, uh, there is a big concern that um, the rule of law will be uh, so fragile. And actually, we we uh, we have a big concern in question: will uh, rule of law will uh, will rule of law st uh, still exist in Kyrgyzstan? And is there still a demand for rule of law? Because people, they got so much in euphoria about Sadr Japarov and they, uh, they actually wait for Sadr, uh, Sadr Japarov to be uh, president so much so that they avoid uh, the necessity, the demand for rule, rule of law, which means that um, this is actually one of the, I think, uh, the potential for conflict that will, um, uh, th that will actually bring a wider gap between the government and actually civil society. And also there's, um, uh, uh -huh. and I would like also to mention about the illustration. Uh, so Sadr Japarov in his, um, 
in his speeches during the meetings in Osh Karasu, he talked so much about illustration. But at the same time, in Talas, uh, where he visited, uh, um, I guess, uh, two weeks ago, uh, he admitted that he uh, he had to, he was used, uh, he actually uh, was obliged to uh, get in his team the uh, his relatives working for him. This is the first fact that he actually admitted. And the second fact that during the elections, we saw so much, um, as Kubat mentioned, advertisements and uh, uh, for Sadirov and etc. And the interesting fact is that um, how actually the illustration could be available in a country where uh, the leader is taking an advantage of the resources of the previous uh, supporters of um, the um, pro-government uh, party Birimdik and the pro of um, uh, the Kingpin's uh, uh, Matraimov's uh, party Mekinim Kyrgyzstan. So if you're down in Osh, you can see that all of the banners that used to actually uh, used to um, advertise, uh, advertise the commercials for those parties, now they're, um, they're being used for Sadr Japarov's campaign. Uh, also, there is another fact that those offices that were used to um, uh, that were used to be the offices of Birimdik and Mekinim Kyrgyzstan, uh, so Many of them are now used for uh, the offices for Sadr Japarov's uh, Japarov campaign, which is actually a big deal because uh, this actually leaves the question how far the illustration is real in Kyrgyzstan under the Sadr Japarov's leadership. And also, I would uh, this third concern that I would uh, I would like to raise is that uh, the regional Kyrgyzstan, uh, especially Kyrgyzstan, which is out of uh, uh, the country, mostly working in Russia as labor migrants, they are too concerned about the um, depth of Kyrgyzstan. They're not concerned about the uh, form of uh, leadership, uh, presidential or parliamentarian. They're not concerned about other political things that also very crucial for Kyrgyzstan, but they are concerned about the debt, especially to China. And they're concerned how this debt will be handled under the leadership of Japarov if uh, he actually had uh, two kind of uh, fails. First, when he was um, just out from the jail, he promised that Kumtor will be handled in the way that he promised and that he uh, was pro-nationalistic before, but then, uh, after two days, he said so. Uh, he admitted that Kumtor issue is a very big deal and he cannot handle that right now and he cannot actually raise the issue of nationalization of, of Kumtor, which actually was uh, kind of a big, uh, you know, big deal for those people who were waiting for uh, the decisive, uh, uh, decisive efforts to get the nationalization done. So. Uh, so th those people actually have the concerns that uh, will Japarov actually with the Jetim 2 in Narin, uh, is he serious about um, giving away uh, Jetim 2? Uh, and uh, um, uh, in this, uh, uh, so will this be his approach actually to uh, get uh, the debt issue done with China? So uh, they are pretty much concerned about this. And I think there's a big bomb. Uh, so about the, if, if we are talking about the consequences and I'll be also touching upon that, but I would go a bit further and say that there is a big bomb uh, here in, uh, in this deal, I guess, in dealing with the debt because, um, so Sadr Japarov is being so much, has, um, how to say, um, um, he is uh, not definite about the depth. He's saying about Jetim to one thing and then there is another thing. And then today from the government, uh, from the leadership of the government in Bishkek, we heard that, uh, you know, so Jetim to uh, giving away Jetim to was, the, was just the opinion of Sadr Japarov. It was not the actual um, issue that we are, uh, as the government of Kyrgyzstan, uh, are handling. So uh, this is uh, mainly the um, the takeaway from Osh, uh, but I would say mainly that I would also uh, actually note that uh, those um, election campaigns that were run during uh, parliamentarian uh, elections, 
in Osh, they're just the same. So what we see, we have from other regions, we have ethnic minorities, and they're being approached by the people of Sadr Japarov in the same way as they were approached by the people of Birimdik uh, previously. Uh, what I'm saying specifically is that we have right now the booming um, construction business. Uh, so there are multi-stored houses being constructed everywhere across the city. And what's happening is that, uh, so we just uh, found out that uh, around 40 uh, residents of uh, the uh, definite um, uh, uh, rayon, uh, they were approached by the construction company saying that uh, from now on, this land is theirs and they're going to build a house there. And they had no actual, uh, you know, um, they were, they had no um, uh, message before. And uh, beating the people, they showed up saying, well, we're going to handle your problem, just vote for us. Okay, so uh, this is the same thing happening right now. So the people are saying uh, that they are representing Sadr Japarov down in Osh, they're approaching uh, the same people, ethnic Uzbeks saying, we're gonna handle your problem. Uh, your land will stay with you. There is no construction company will take over, but just vote for us. And that's actually the um, one actual fact that uh, it's all the same. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and now, and sort of uh, uh, now, if we could go to uh, Bakit uh, for you know his perspective as somebody who's been you know worked uh, in the Kyrgyz government for a long time, who's who's now uh, outside of, of government uh, and overseas. You know, what is the sort of the historic protect perspective? What is um, you know the trajectory for Kyrgyzstan? Um, what are the what are the democratic prospects, and and what do you see sort of? Uh, from your perspective as somebody who's now outside um, uh, of why is this happening and and you know what what's the way forward so please and i know uh, he has a few slides so i think you're uh, still muted thank you uh do you hear me yes yeah, uh, first of all, Paul, thank you very much for defining the right approach to this uh, problem. And uh, secondly, I would like uh, to uh, just uh, also thanks uh, all speakers for sharing very valuable information. And uh, now I would like to turn your attention to some essentials of this situation. Have we lost? Uh... Two thousand five and two thousand twenty have happened after the parliamentary uh, elections. Uh, this constitutional referendum is aims to reverse the outcomes of a constitutional referendum in two thousand ten. All regime changes were instigated and organized by the wealthy elites, who used the ordinary people as their weapon. But what is happening now has very distinctive traits. If before the key actors, their capacity and aims were known, now we deal with the lift, the flap politics. When we lift one flap, we see another flap. And how many flaps, we don't know. Many legitimate questions and only few answers. And here I would like to uh, ask Tatiana to bring to our attention the, my first uh, slide. We have, uh, uh, we have these uh, questions, but we don't have answers to these questions. And without answers to these questions, we cannot uh, explain and understand the situation. Sadr Japarov, fresh of prison, has risen suddenly as, as anti-establishment movement leader, a leader of radical, transformative political change. Kyrgyzstan didn't see the populist and demagogue of such scale. He became the symbol of ordinary people's grievances and their only hope. He rises from the failure of mainstream politics and today invented the mainstream politics at the center of which is his phenomenon. 
Secondly, we see appearance of triumvirate, a system of government wherein free people share the highest political power. Sadr Jabbar of France, Kanchi Bektashi, is the head of National Security Committee, and Talant Mamedev is the interim president. We still don't know how they forced President Jim Becker to resign, impose their will on the entire national elite, and set up tight control over president administration, government, and parliament during a concise period of time. It's still puzzling. Previously, after 2005, Bakiv, and uh, after 2010, Atambayev, spent one or two years to consolidate such power. Japarov did it in a very short period of time. After that, old factors like South North do not play a decisive role today. The Kyrgyz triumvirate has popular support in all opponents combined have more than 1 million followers in a country with 6 million. The number of his opponents combined followers in this election is not even remotely close to this number. His mm -hmm. opponents, the progressive politicians are alienated from a broad mass of a native rural population. And uh, if you uh, look at to the, my second uh, slide, um, uh, Tanya, I think we're having some problems with his. Oh, his voice is back. Okay, uh, it's okay, and I see that. Uh, in my view, we have uh, some signs that he is connected to Bakir's clan. The Bakir's clan, at this uh, should be investigated and explained. Secondly, I would like to uh, uh, just um, explain a little bit about the situation in the Kyrgyz uh, prison system. Kyrgyzstan is the only country in the region where all prisons. Control. And that's why we can just uh, guess that probably here is the connection of uh, Sadir Japarov and his uh, sudden rise with the criminal world, not only of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, two years ago, it was the big gathering of uh, uh, thieves on law in the post-Soviet era in Tashkent, and they decided to connect the uh, criminal world of the Central Asia to the Russian criminal world. And after that, if you look attentively to the uh, Kamchi Kolbaev and his role, and uh, we uh, should uh, just uh, ask ourselves, is it a connection between Kamchi Kolbaev, criminal world, and Sadir Japarov? Because uh, how it is possible during very short period of time to organize and to maintain such expensive uh, political campaign. Uh, I uh, was manager of a presidential campaign of Atambayev in 2009. And uh, I analyzed some videos uh, of Sadr Japarov. Uh, and uh, I can say that uh, I calculated carefully, calculated and uh, uh, taken uh, to account my experience. Uh, his one meeting, one meeting uh, in my uh, assessment costs about uh, more than $20,000, at least, at least. But he organized this campaign almost in all cities, all 
uh, uh, capitals of provinces and, uh, and so on. And this is a big amount of money. And probably this is connected to the amnesty of capital of his policy. And probably amnesty of capitals uh, just aimed to ask all these wealthy people in Kyrgyzstan, oligarchs, to invest in his campaign. Regarding the trajectory of, of Kyrgyzstan, today there are no viable alternatives to Japarov and this triumvirate. They enjoy popular support and have real chances to win on January 10. After that, their supporters can determine the outcomes of the election to the parliament. But triumvirate uses existing liberties in the country to reestablish the strongman rule based on popular support. He wants to heal embryo of parliamentarism as a corrupt and alien to the Kyrgyzstan system of governance. Sadr Japarov aims to unite traditionalists, nationalists, religiously conservative ordinary people against the Kyrgyz establishment and redesign society's construction. To maximize his power, he will strive to establish a modern authoritarian police state. In that sense, politically, he is close to leaders like Trump, Erdogan, or Orban. Hi, Siva. Maybe just about a, a, few, a few seconds left because we have a lot of questions coming in all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. And uh, oh, I see the democratic prospects for our country. Uh, given that young Kyrgyz democracy rests on the balance of regional clans, political groups, and emerging civil society, uh, uh, I can say that Sadr Japarov can change the balance of power and establish strong Milan rule. But these, uh, his regime's durability depends on the state of economy and basic social services for people. It is a populist protest movement. It often asks good questions, blames its opponents, but uh, have no answers to these questions. There are no serious signs that he, that he uh, understands the complexity of problems and promote needed reforms. He inherited the burden of misdevelopment and an unbalanced economy. So the country's problems pose huge challenges even to uh, effective progressive leaders. Like all populist Sadir Japaro's movements gains traction of scolding the elites for corruption. But today, being in power, he, I think he will out-corrupt them. Here, Thanks. I'd like to end. Great, thank you very much. Now, if we could just go maybe to the to the first question that Asel, um, you know, put out about, um, you know, what are the consequences of the return to this presidential system? What are the consequences of the return towards this, you know, greater authoritarian? You know, we've got questions about, you know, whether whether Kyrgyzstan, you know, whether that island of democracy notion is 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 relevant anymore. Uh, it, it, it certainly seems like it's not. Um, uh, but you know, what are the implications of of this move? You're on mute. I think um, uh, such a cliche um, has to be actually removed from Kyrgyzstan is a long overdue. Uh, Kyrgyzstan hasn't been really an island of democracy. It has been always a patronal presidentialism, right? To, to use um, Henry Hale's uh, term. Um, it's a form of um, institutions uh, which are very typical to, to Eurasia and where president plays always a strong role. And um, in 2010, it didn't really matter that we uh, kind of transited towards uh, semi-parliamentarism because the president always stayed strong. And this is one of the major sources of our instability, of our constant swings between uh, uh, presidentialism towards semi-presidentialism and back to presidentialism. And unless we remove this um, temptation to use the coercive power of the state, unless we remove the strong presidentialism and therefore the president's access to uh, intimidation, cooptation and other means to basically end uh, political pluralism, uh, Kyrgyzstan will be always remaining in this very hyper instability. So this is one thing and therefore um, although um, the developments right now immediately look really scary, 
I would be far from saying that this is definitive because I think there's gonna be another swing back to some sort of pluralism. Why? Because for one thing, um, the window of opportunity, which was open in 2010 with the semi-parliamentarism lasted for some, um, not 10 years, a little bit less because um, President Atambayev already tried to usurp power by uh, nominating his political heir in 2017. That's where I think really the uh, regress began actually. And today we have a simply culmination of this regress. Uh, but this window of opportunity still nevertheless lasted for some time. And this created uh, some larger elites, the business elites. Um, I'm not saying that they are all Democrats and liberals, but definitely they enjoy freedom, freedom to conduct business, freedom to, um, uh, to be in politics. So um, I don't know to which extent um, they will be today happy uh, to um, get under a tighter control and maybe even repression organized by uh, the new uh, presidency. So uh, most likely this um, cycle of uh, returning to the strong presidentialism will not, will not last that long. Uh, this is one of my hopes. Yet there are going to be uh, repercussions of this referendum and of the return to authoritarianism, obviously. For the moment, I cannot speak of the long-term consequences because nobody can speak of long-term consequences in Kyrgyzstan. This is absolutely impossible. But we can still kind of think about the um, immediate um, and uh, the a little bit um, medium-term consequences. So um, what I'm seeing, um, how people perceive Japarov and how they connect hopes and the group to him is that um, uh, the expectations that they place into him, and they really very a wide ra range of expectations, uh, people really wanting from him all sorts of things. Um, uh, most likely he will not be able to meet them because their, uh, their Kyrgyz economy is um, almost on the same level as in 94. And even previously, even before actually the October event, um, according to World Bank um, report, it was saying that the Kyrgyz economy never managed actually to catch up the standards of development prior to independence. So uh, given the actually the huge gap in the budget and no prospects of really getting any international aid, uh, I think the, the prospects of Chaparov to meet the economic ends and uh, satisfy all those expectations are very meager. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think China is going to jump in. And that's where we're going to, I think, going to be uh, very interesting developments because the, partly um, the Japarov support is anti-Chinese support. There are huge anti-Chinese uh, sentiments. And I'm, I'm not saying that they are fully um, kind of naturally grown, homegrown. There is some also, I, I see at least some kind of that it's artificially being uh, constructed as an anti-Chinese discourse. Nevertheless, there are the sentiments, although Japarov will be bound to China because this is the only country that will be willing to give um, a huge credit uh, independently, uh, whether the, uh, the leader is a Democrat or a populist. So, uh, but that would create a lot of repercussions for the national identity project that he's trying to, uh, to construct to nationalism and, uh, and so on. And that's where I think uh, being unable to meet this um, demand uh, yet he will have to somehow release these tensions and frustrations elsewhere. And that's why, where I'm becoming concerned that he will uh, find uh, other gay scopes, uh, gay, uh, I'm sorry, um, scapegoats, such as ethnic minorities, sexual minorities, feminist women in general to channel uh, the uh, popular frustrations. And the past 10 years were already marked by such um, uh, development, this uh, ethnic minority, sexual minorities, all these people were already being a scapegoat for all this, the crisis of masculinity in Kyrgyzstan, right? And I think this is going to be only jeopardized. Okay, great. Um, maybe we could jump uh, on that topic to um, Akhilai. We've got a question about sort of, you know, what are the feelings of the of the Uzbek community, particularly in the South? Um, and if you could give us some, some perspectives. I uh, also have a question to you about sort of how criminality in the South um, uh, functions. Um, uh, uh, is there only, you know, Matrimov or are there other criminal leaders that have equal power in, uh, in politics there? 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So um, there is a comment on Twitter saying that mm -hmm. Uzbeks were voting uh, always for the um, for the power or for the perceived power. So this is true, absolutely. And uh, um, because uh, we could see what happened uh, uh, during the campaign, uh, presidential campaign of Babanov in Onadir. Uh, that's uh, the district where uh, ethnic minorities uh, mostly live. And uh, so it was uh, a hugely provo provocative uh, um, event where uh, Babanov uh, and uh, uh, not just Babanov actually suffered from that, but uh, the his supporters in Onadir. So that was a huge lesson learned from uh, this case uh, to many Uzbeks living here, uh, not just in Osh, but also in other regions uh, of Southern Kyrgyzstan. So um, the model of uh, supporting and, you know, not just supporting, but the participation in political uh, events uh, uh, was actually adapted and, uh, you know, um, it, it, it was not new, like uh, under uh, Atambayev's leadership, uh, it was always there during Akayev's leadership, Bakiev's leadership, and etc. But I would mainly highlight that during Atambayev's leadership, uh, uh, it was kind of highlighted for Uzbek that um, they have to stay with people in power because that's the sign of stability for them. And, um, and the June events were actually echoing in those arguments uh, more and more. So um, I think uh, the situation for Uzbeks never changed with uh, uh, Sadr Japarov's leadership. Uh, I think it just uh, this model uh, is being uh, inherited and is being used wi wildly. And I just uh, told you about that. Um, so, and um, uh, I'm 100% sure that um, Uzbeks, uh, they will be voting for Sadr Japarov, uh, uh, not because, you know, they share those sentiments that uh, widely Kyrgyz population is sharing right now, but because uh, he is the absolute unconditional uh, candidate uh, that uh, will definitely uh, step in the office and uh, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to spoil their future. They don't want to have, uh, get in trouble with a lot of leadership so that they will be, of course, uh, voting uh, like uh, with whole families and with whole uh, mahalas for uh, Sadr Japarov. That's absolutely predictive. Uh, another thing is that how the issues will be handled under uh, Sadr Japarov's leadership, because it's very interesting because if the theory that Sadr, of, uh, Sadr Japarov's leadership is coming is or being sourced uh, from Maxim Bakiev or Bakiev's family, uh, that's uh, we know that uh, for Uzbek minorities, uh, Bakiev's leadership was not the best one. So um, what we know from many reports is that uh, during Bakiev's leadership, many Uzbek leaders were oppressed. Uh, many businesses uh, actually and uh, entrepreneurs, they had to pay even more under Bakiev's leadership. So uh, during Akhaev's leadership, it was kind of favorable, uh, but during Bakiev's leadership, uh, many uh, leaders they, of Uzbek minorities, they had to actually, they, they were in, in big struggle. So if Sadr Japarov will be sourcing the general line of uh, uh, his so-called patrons uh, on uh, handling the uh, ethnic minorities, um, the, the issues of handling the ethnic minorities, I'm sure that, that, that it will actually um, fuel more, um, uh, more I, I would say fuel more oil into the uh, already big uh, trouble uh, since 2010. So, and also, I would also note on the elections that uh, it's not just the, with the ethnic minorities, uh, but the, with, uh, uh, with minorities, I would say, uh, eventually uh, the civil society activists, uh, we found ourselves uh, as minority too. So what I expect is that uh, not just ethnic minorities, but also the independent journalists, the bloggers, the civil activists, the NGOs, huge civil society organizations, uh, we are all in target of um, huge intimidation uh, because we are the first um, actual, not just, you know, the troublemakers, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so, but we are 
uh, the easy way to grab and to show uh, the uh, the power. Uh, we are easy to approach uh, and we are easy to brand as if we are pro-Western or we are not pro-Kyrgyz and etc. So um, I expect that this will come and uh, this will come not just uh, with the new parliament, but it will come like with the new um, office of president. So uh, that, that's the uh, hugest big concern. And I would also add that um, the uh, people who actually ask the questions about Sadir Japarov, um, they are becoming more and more, which is actually absolutely interesting phenomenon in Kyrgyzstan because from absolute uh, euphoria in the beginning of October, we are actually uh, foreseeing, uh, witnessing actually how uh, the people in Chui Oblast uh, and the people from other re regions like Aksi in Jalalabad, they are uh, raising the questions how Sadr Japarov is legitimate, how far he is true leader, if he actually, one, uh, handles, the, um, handles the power in, in a way that uh, favors himself. For instance, if you remember, he led the Matraim of Go from the jail and he took uh, like 200 million soms. And there was uh, a big grievance from Aksu region uh, where uh, the people actually were in fight after the elections and one of them was injured and uh, passed away. So, and uh, two people who are allegedly uh, found guilty, they are now in prison waiting for the court. And his relatives, actually their relatives, they asked Sadr Japarov to uh, let them go because, you know, by their opinion, they are not that guilty. And this is very interesting because uh, Sadir Japarov, he himself set the precedent that he can actually handle the court and handle the justice and rule of law himself without any, you know, the uh, traditional system of court and etc. And people believed in that, right? And now when they approach Sadir Japarov to handle the same way as he handled for Matraimov, they actually, their uh, um, uh, request was rejected. And these people now question like, how is Sadir Japarov his real true leader? Why is that that he is actually letting the people in corruption go, but the people who are actually with their grievances in no corruption, etc., they still in prison. This is the first. And the next thing is that uh, people in Chui Oblast actually- we got a couple uh, other questions saw, so we can, we're at the end. So yeah, we can, okay. Uh, we saw many uh, videos where actually the, the man from Chui Oblast were saying that Sadr Japarov, you are no longer true leader for us because you are surrounded by the bandits. Thank you. Okay, uh, we, so we've sort of run out of time, but we we can go a few minutes over if that's okay with uh, with everyone else. You know, one of the questions that I think we we've 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 come up is, you know, what are some common characteristics about the people who support um, uh, Japarov? You know, what is the income level? You know, are they urban, rural? Um, do they have strong conservative, religious views, nationalist views, or is it just sort of all a broad spectrum of that? I don't know if if Kubat or Bakhtik or Russell have any any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, oh, come on. Okay. You're fine. Uh, actually, it's been like uh, several weeks since uh, I'm working in Bishkek, and before start uh, before starting my work in Bishkek, uh, I've been to my home uh, village, which is, is the, in the same region as Japarov's re region. Yes, and I've been I've uh, I spoke to. Uh, many people in my village and uh, all of them, many of them are, are kind of hypnotized, yes, I could say, because uh, I, I try to um, kind of uh, explain uh, the situation and uh, other points of view to them and uh, they uh, didn't seem to be accepting. Uh, uh, those uh, alternative ideas or alternative uh, uh, opinions. And I've also, in my opinion, I guess, um, uh, people uh, uh, who are supporting uh, Japarov are frustrated 
because what we have experienced uh, uh, for last couple of years, and especially because what we have experienced uh, during the uh, pandemic, and uh, they say that the main, they have a lot of uh, economic problems. They, they are um, concerned about the rising uh, food prices. And as Asel said, um, they think that uh, Japarov, when Japarov comes to the power, when Japarov, if Japarov is elected as, as the new president, he will solve all these uh, problems. So in my opinion, I guess uh, we are witnessing um, kind of rise of maybe nationalism and also um, rise of uh, conservatism and uh, traditionalism in our society. And I've also noticed that uh, um, we are witnessing the result of uh, the lack of education in our society for the last couple of uh, decades. I think that's, a, that, that's increasingly a, a problem uh, elsewhere in the world as well. Uh, Batik, if you have uh, any thoughts on that uh, quickly and, and um, please. We see the rise of a populist movement uh, in Kyrgyzstan unseen before. That's why Japarov uh, unites uh, uh, people from all uh, segments of society who are frustrated uh, strongly by the uh, uh, you know, interim government after 2010, Atambayev and the Jane Becker's regime. They failed to uh, just uh, kept their promises because when they came to power, they uplifted the expectations of a people to the level that they cannot uh, sustain and failed. And after that, it's a nationalistic uh, movement. And that's why I would like just to turn your attention to the uh, concerns of, a uh, of a, a, a ethnic minorities. I uh, discussed this issue with uh, the Uzbek fellows whom I know uh, from my work in Osh. And when I ask, can I just uh, quote you or mention you, uh, all of them just ask me, just keep us, uh, uh, you know, uh, just privately in our names. But they told, they were concerned by the return of Mirza Khmatov. Uh, they are uh, concerned by the nationalistic sentiments of Japarov. They are concerned by the uh, country back Tashif who positioned himself as a, a leader of uh, uh, Kyrgyz uh, uh, nationalists and so on. That's why they are today thinking what. Okay, uh, we, we've lost you again, so I might uh, uh, pivot to sort of some, some final thoughts. Um, you know, I think you, you've, you've highlighted, you know, the, the tremendous problems uh, that the country is facing. You know, will, will uh, Japara face that same, you know, high expectations and uh, unable to deliver? Uh, he doesn't seem to have any huge promises, you know, huge programs, but the country's got, you know, enormous problems with education, enormous problems in the economy, enormous public health problems. Is he going to face that same problem? And, and are we going to sort of end up uh, anytime soon in a similar sort of political tumult in, in the country? Uh, any one of the panelists, I don't know, Asel or, or Kubat or anybody. Sorry, I didn't understand. So you are suggesting that there's going to be another? Uh, the no, I'm just wondering. I mean, um, uh, uh, we have, um, uh, the ambassador just mentioned that he, um, you know, the other, uh, uh, the other leaders uh, who've been uh, pushed out, um, they had such high expectations of the population to solve all the problems. It seems like Japarov is also putting out expectations that he, you know, with his populism can, can solve the problems, but the problems the country faces are huge. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, is he gonna face that same sort of, um, uh, you know, disenchantment at some point? And, and what are the prospects for, for more tumult coming, coming down simply because the problems continue to grow? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are all these st structural sources for instability. For one thing is, the, of course, the economic situation in the country, um, uh, which is aggravated by the pandemic um, and uh, the, the world, um, the state of world. Um, and um, on the other hand, simply this, as I mentioned already, this uh, very problematic institution of president presidency in Kyrgyzstan, which is going to continue simply uh, being a source of uh, uh, instability. And um, I mean, there are different opinions. People say that um, the maximum giving some two, three years to Japarov before he's also ousted by somebody else. What I'm concerned with is that this kind of um, 
political behavior of ending with undesired uh, political elites with ousting is becoming a norm. Like uh, ordinary people simply saying, oh, this is not a problem. We bring him to power, but we, we're also going to be the ones who are going to depose him from power. Kind of seems like a very easy game, kind of a very direct connection to politics to as a representative democracy um, uh, in execution. But um, I'm really kind of concerned that this is becoming a, uh, a normalcy for Kyrgyzstan, for ordinary people, because this is, of course, going to uh, bring the country to um, anarchy. And does it solve the people's problems at all? Um, no. uh, uh, any final thoughts? We have a couple, you know, final thoughts about, you know, uh, final questions about criminality. Uh, you know, is there any prospects to address this? Uh, I think we've talked about China a little bit. Uh, any thoughts about Russia? Um, and, and, you know, has Japarov consolidated uh, support with Russia or with at least, you know, groups that ha have ties to Russia? Any final thoughts on, on any of those issues before we end it uh, a few minutes late? Sure. Uh, Kyrgyzstan already in a, uh, China's death trap, and uh, that's why I think for uh, survival of this regime, uh, Sadr Japal will uh, try to just uh, make connections with China uh, more viable. Uh, how it will happen, we don't know. How it, we don't know. Uh, secondly, he, of course, he will try to uh, just uh, get closer to Russia, to group closer. But uh, regarding the West, uh, uh, Japarov's movement is anti-Western, uh, anti-Western populist movement. And he will uh, try to uh, maximize his influence and power on that uh, kind of sentiments. And uh, you are right that uh, he just uh, rises on the expectation of uh, people to the level which will not uh, cannot uh, sustain. But uh, I think that uh, after this uh, presidential election, they will try to determine the outcomes of the upcoming uh, parliamentary election and can consolidate power for the next uh, few years, for a few years, given uh, their popularity. But after that, we, it's uh, difficult to predict because I don't see any signs that they will be successful in modernization of a country and introducing structural reforms in economy. Great. Uh, Kubata, Sel, Akila, any final thoughts? Uh, just uh, one uh, thought. Um, of course, we are yet to see who will win uh, this election, but uh, sure. uh, the new uh, members of this new government which came to power after the October events, they are admitting themselves that they have very limited time and they have very limited uh, uh, confidence uh, given uh, from the uh, voters. And for example, the head of the, the current government, uh, not the head, the chief staff of this uh, government uh, recently said uh, uh, to me in an interview that uh, they have only around six or eight months uh, to show something to uh, voters. Otherwise, uh, people start uh, showing their frustration uh, again. So, but at the same time, uh, the current government uh, and uh, alongside Japarov are giving quite a huge uh, promises and, uh, and they are giving a lot of uh, yes uh, promises and also they are promising a lot of reforms whether it will be delivered within those uh, 6 months or 8 months uh, it is a big question okay thank you uh, akilai or uh, asel any final comments or uh, or just maybe one very final uh, word about Russia. I mean, I'm really looking forward how actually the, the relationship between uh, the new um, leadership and the Russia going to develop because I'm not sure that Russia actually uh, wants such a neighbor, a nationalist um, uh, with a con a religious connotations on, on its southern borders. Um, Russia was already very tense uh, when they with the interethnic conflict in 2010 uh, because although the conflict was, was between the Kyrgyz and the the, uh, and the, the Uzbeks, uh, the Russians had also by side effects on this as well. Um, and um, so uh, it would be interesting how to kind of to, 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 to observe that because um, if right. uh, Russia also gonna turn back, um, China is gonna be our main partner and that's gonna be very problematic. Yep, great. All right. Thank you very much. So the final words for me would be that uh, you know, we were panic, we were pessimistic, but now I see that uh, uh, that uh, 
if Japarov will be, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, more and more aggressive towards uh, the civil society, not just the civil society, but, you know, the uh, people in common. And also, uh, if we see more and more uh, this kind of, you know, situations where actually he says one thing and then he does another thing, or he does one thing for himself and for his friends, and then he does another thing for ordinary people, then I expect, I'm very opti optimistic here, but then I expect that the civil society will grow, the civil society will be even much uh, stronger, uh, especially the journalists, the media, the bloggers, the activists, and I see here the opportunity for this, um, I would say the, you know, uh, the minority of Kyrgyz society to actually build the bridges with the regional uh, influencers and regional um, leaders uh, right. that actually uh, is a problem. It's a big gap between us. So mm -hmm. I see here the, uh, the opportunity for us. It's good. It's always good to end on a slightly more optimistic note. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I want to thank uh, all four of you for uh, your participation and your insights today. I apologize to both you and, and our audience for going a little bit over, but there was a lot to talk about and, and a lot of interesting questions came in. Um, I want to uh, also remind our audience that we have another session uh, on Kazakhstan's parli um, um, parliamentary elections. What's next? It's going to be hosted by GW on Tuesday, uh, the 12th of January at, at 10 a.m. Uh, Washington, D.C. time. I want to thank everybody, both our speakers and our audience and our co-sponsors, and hope everybody uh, stays safe uh, and we'll be watching what happens uh, uh, in Kyrgyzstan uh, this weekend.